Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yahdihi allahu fala mudillala wa man yudlilhu fala hadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our own bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakeem. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafquhu qawli. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Juma Mubarak to you all. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll be talking about a topic that I, or a title I've uh, called this khutbah of perfect imperfection. So before we begin, I want to just show you an image, inshallah, uh, to kind of ground us with respect to what, what we're conceptualizing. So in, uh, in, in the Japanese tradition, uh, there is this um, art of kintsugi. We, we've talked about it before in, in different settings in our Sira class and, uh, and elsewhere, but this art of um, embracing the imperfect, this art of, uh, beauty, of finding beauty through that which is imperfect. Uh, th this art form consists of repairing uh, broken pottery by means of uh, mending the areas of breakage with uh, gold or uh, with some powdered uh, silver or platinum, just something precious so that uh, even if something you know, shatters, if it's a bowl or, or if it's just a drinking cup or a vessel, uh, it, it still bears a, uh, a, a kind of uniqueness to it when, when it is repaired, that when it's repaired, it, uh, it becomes even more valuable than it was when it was uh, complete. And so not just is this a philosophy and ways of using it, but this is a also not just is this a way of, of just completely reusing something and, and repairing it, but this is also philosophy in the sense of treating breakage, repair, woundedness as a part of the history of an object rather than something that is meant to be uh, disguised. And so inshallah, today we'll be talking about this concept of perfect imperfection. You know, how many of us have dishes, how many of us have plates or vases that, you know, fall and they break uh, or they get chipped and they shatter. And that's the end of that story for them. You know, we will rush to take it to the trash. We won't even give it a second thought. But when we take a look at this art form and we put it in conversation with respect to how we operate and how we might treat ourselves when we treat ourselves as these vases that when we inevitably break when we inevitably get chipped how do we address ourselves and what this art form teaches us is that uh the end of uh, the brokenness the shatteredness the however low we can get is not the end of our story that there's there's more to to come about that and what's really peculiar as i mentioned earlier is that the broken bowl that is then annealed and that is then fixed uh, according to this art style actually becomes many more times valuable uh, than just the bowl as if it was without any chips. And so as I mentioned, I want us to see ourselves as these bowls. I want us to think of ourselves as human beings going through as, as the pottery that we are, you know, we, the Quran says that we are, you know, made of clay that just think of ourselves as these, these pottery, um, you know, vessels going through life and naturally going through the trials of this world, we're going to get chipped. We're going to get broken uh, and because we, we make mistakes. You know, we, we're, we're, we're only finite. Uh, there will be things that happen that uh, cause us to break in different ways. But what this lifts up for us is that our scars and our brokenness and our chips and the fact that we may just completely fall apart, that doesn't define us. And that's not our defining characteristic. Uh, like the 
kintsugi bowls uh, and the art pieces, the repairs that we put on ourselves, the repairs that we do upon ourselves, the healing that we do is what defines us. It's a sort of perfect imperfection that we are marked by these signs of imperfection, but the way we've addressed them uh, brings about a new kind of a perfect. And so what's uh, really important to recognize is that Islam itself recognizes our limitations. It recognizes our weaknesses as humans, but as we talked about last week, um, it not only calls us to be better, but it does so in a way that meets us where we are. Think about, uh, you know, the, the person who is who is annealing these broken bowls. It's, they're not doing it from like a machine and, and just, you know, completely, uh, you know, not, not personalizing the process. They're taking the time to take each and every piece and putting it together and annealing it and making it something more beautiful. And looking at the Islamic tradition, looking at the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, of doing the same to us, to take us as we are broken uh, and to provide this, this tender healing that is not something that is divorced from anything but compassion. And so what's important before we, you know, progress is to try and understand to ourselves, how do we define perfection? Perfection for many of us is, is, is oftentimes told to be, uh, you know, you have to have your beard like this, you have to be praying like this, your hands like this or like this, um, that you have to be standing like this, that your hair has to look like this, or your fingernails have to be trimmed like this, and all these different things that these are, uh, this is what makes a perfect believer, or that your or that your recitation of the Quran or your memorization has to be like this, and all these different things that are on the superficial level are held to be standards of a perfect believer, um, and they're made to feel like that, but it's really important that we understand what the Prophet ﷺ lifted up as perfection, especially as it related to faith. And a few hadith that I'll lift up here uh, speak to that. The first being that the most perfect believer in respect of faith, the most perfect believer with respect to faith is the one who is the best in their manners. And among the believers who show the most perfect faith are those who have the best behavior and are the kindest to their families. The one who is the most uh, proficient in the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ relates, is the one who will be no with noble and righteous scribes, i.e. the angels. But the one who reads it and stumbles over it, finding it difficult, will have two rewards, or maybe have double the reward, or have two in, in that sense. Thinking about how our tradition lifts up the struggle lifts up the fact that it's not about, you know, just, just doing everything to uh, a perfect quantifiable, a quantifiable ability to, to be able to perfect something like razor edge um, and, and to be able to do something with respect to our faith practices in a perfect sense, but to just be good people at the root of it. And this khutbah inshallah, and this message we were, we were sharing uh, within the prison and uh, just this last week and to see how that speaks to people who have made mistakes, uh, for brothers who have made mistakes, who've done uh, something wrong, and now they're, you know, uh, they're, they're going through uh, what society has deemed as the, the price to pay for uh, their mistakes, but to see that they're not defined by that. They may be known as serial numbers or branded, um, you know, but that doesn't strip them of their dignity or of their humanity, at least within course to Islam, that they are, they don't need to be people if they come to the faith that they have to master every single aspect as if it's perfect uh, and, and to a degree of what we term as perfection. But at the baseline level, wherever we might be at, we strive for being the best in respect to our manners, being the best with respect to our behavior, being the best with respect to how we treat our family, and even uplifting, as the Prophet ﷺ did in this last hadith, that even though we strive for perfection, the struggle itself is what defines uh, our efforts. It's not so much the end goal that says like we, you know, you got to the best state of your recitation or the best state of, of this proficiency, but the struggle, the day in, day out struggle to do so is what's lifted up. Surah Al-Asr, the 103rd chapter of the Quran, touches upon humanity's condition with respect to saying that while Asr, by uh, the fleeting time, that verily humanity is in a state of loss or humanity is, 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 in a, is just in uh, this continuous perpetual state of loss, except 
those who believe and do righteous deeds and recommend one another to the truth and perform all kinds of good deeds which Allah has ordained and abstain from all the kinds of sins and evil which Allah has forbidden and recommend one another to patience. It's very important that says uh, in Surah Al-Asr, it, it talks about uh, it talks about all of humanity. And then within that group of humanity, there are people who are uh, doing good deeds, who believe, who are, who are doing what's right, but they are not divorced from humanity itself. They are still within humanity. And from our tradition, we know that the people who got themselves right, who perfected their faith, were not just complete, were not people who were absolutely perfect with respect to the rituals, especially when we relate to the, uh, the pious predecessors, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, their overall faith journey, their perfection of faith uh, was not divorced from their imperfection of being. Just looking in our tradition, uh, Adam, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, this concept of original sin in Christianity and this aspect of fall, uh, this, this mistake that was made with respect to biting of the fruit and uh, you know, uh, chewing of that which was forbidden. Um, in Islam, Adam ascended to an even further level in terms of higher spirituality, in terms of a higher rank, after that mistake, that mistake was not something that defined Adam, that uh, the repentance was what defined Adam, the uh, request for forgiveness and, 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 you know, the seeking of God's pleasure after the uh, causing of displeasure was what defined Adam, not the state of perpetual fall or perpetual loss um, that, that is attributed to one act, but to see that Adam uh, was able to overcome that, was able to request uh, repentance, and because of that, ro uh, rose to an even higher degree than where uh, Adam was beforehand, that rose to a degree of a prophet. And, and so seeing that there is uh, ascension after this kind of uh, descending with respect to when we make these mistakes, the uh, Sahaba um, as well, you have people who buried their daughters, you had people who were hurting other Muslims, who were persecuting other people, who were uh, stealing from other people, who were causing injustices, who were uh, taking slaves and not, not providing any kind of just uh, manner for them to free themselves, who are abusing others and causing harm, who are, uh, you know, taking advantage of the most marginalized in society, these people becoming who we would know as the models of perfect faith, who would become the people who we refer to uh, with the uh, the the honorific after their name of may Allah that uh, may Allah be pleased with them or that Allah is pleased with them and they're pleased with him. And you know we, we see that these were very imperfect people but they weren't defined by that imperfection. They were defined by that transformation and the later expression of faith that they had committed. Even furthermore, you had uh, the likes of Ibn Atayullah who stated that it may be a sin that creates brokenness and humbleness before God, but it is better than good deeds that create arrogance. You see that in the example of the Sahaba, you have uh, these companions who are utterly, um, you know, gone from the path. There's a reason that a Prophet ﷺ came to them um, and a divine intervention was brought. It was not because it was a city of angels. It's because they were in need of that guidance. But the, the definition that we have of them, the image that we have of them, this image of perfect faith comes out of a state of deep imperfection uh, to a state of spiritual perfection. But you see, it's part of that process. It's not divorced from it. There was also the story uh, that we shared in the uh, in the prison that resonated with uh, the brothers there, but the story of uh, Al Fudail ibn Ayyad, who was uh, who was a highway robber um, in uh, the time of early Islam after the Prophet passed away. Um, you had you had uh, this person who was a highway robber in Arabia, um, who was a career highway robber, but also uh, his night was just as worse as his day. He would commit uh, robbery in the morning and uh, in the in the late evening, nighttime would commit zina um, behind a certain valley and so you know the the story of him being able to come to his uh to to be able to come to his senses but encounter his faith we were talking last time faith meeting you where you are certain things happening when you are ready for them uh and when you are uh ready to embrace them and for uh al-fudail happening when he uh was was going you know to to go commit zina and he hears uh, a verse being recited by a man sitting in a tent or sitting to the side uh the verse 
relating that has the time not come for those who have believed that their hearts have uh, that their hearts should become humbly submissive at the remembrance of Allah and what has come down uh, of the truth. Let them not be like those who were given the scripture before and a long period of time passed over them so that their hearts hardened and many of them are defiantly disobedient. Again, uh, Al-Fudayl was a Muslim, but clearly was not living a, a very Islamic life. And so when he hears this, his heart is touched and he says, indeed, yes, this is the time. Responding to, has the time not come? He says, indeed, this is the time. And he leaves that area uh, and he, he's, he's obviously kind of distressed and goes away, but he's walking. He sees a group of travelers who are just sitting amongst themselves and they're like, which route should we take? You know, this route that we take here, uh, Fudel is known to raid that route. Uh, and if we take this other route, uh, it's going to be uh, a bit more difficult. So what do we do? And he hears this and he begins to cry. He, he hears this, he grabs his beard and he says, you know, during the night I soiled myself in the disobedience of God. And in the morning there's people, believers, fellow Muslims who fear my presence. I don't see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me hear that this conversation, except that he wanted me to come back to the right path. And uh, he repents to Allah. And what's really beautiful is that he chooses to live his life out in, uh, in Mecca, uh, near the Masjid al-Haram, uh, near the Kaaba, in the company of scholars. And this man who was known as a highway robber, as this person who would cause uh, disaster to other people, to um, steal from them, to also commit zina and do all these things, ended up becoming the man who was known as Imam al-Haramain. The, the imam of the two mosques. He became the imam of Mecca. He became the imam of Medina, uh, of the most sacred sites in Islam. You had this person who was uh, of the most, uh, you know, feared, but also with respect to when you look at the, their biography, um, probably uh, the, the most, uh, the, the, you know, the, the last person you would think of with respect to taking this mantle. And you see that uh, this is this was enabled by uh, not just Islam with respect to the aspect of uh, allowing for transformation, but you also see that this is what our tradition is. Our tradition meets you where you're at, regardless of who you were before you came or regardless where you were, that that door is always open regardless of that time, that you can, you can be in the wrong, so far wrong, but uh, in accordance to Allah, that true repentance, true uh, cognizance and consciousness of your faults uh, is the first step to being able to redeem yourself and your faults and your uh, sins and all these things will not define you, at least in the, in, in, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that these do not define you, your repentance is what does. And so we look at the, when we look at this art form of kintsugi, and we see that the bowl is not defined by its brokenness, but by even more beautifulness of its uh, of its anneals and of its uh, of its healing of its um, you know new connectedness. Uh, its its beauty is now in the wounds that it brought about. And we ask that Allah enable our hearts to be turned. We ask Allah that uh, our sins be forgiven and our sins become these golden lines or these golden badges of honor as we repent for them, as we heal from them, that our sins are not definitive of us, but our repentance of them and our seeking forgiveness and our uh, diving into correcting them is what does. And in the closing of this khutbah, inshallah, we will lift up some hadith and wisdoms from our tradition on how we can emerge from our sins as better Muslims, not held down or weighed down by them, wherever we are, whoever we are, and where we come from. I say these words of mine, and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all of humanity, and I ask Allah to bestow peace and blessings on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first hadith that we'll share is uh, of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which he says that by the one in whose hand is my soul, if you speak to the community, if you did not sin, Allah would replace you with the people who would sin. And they would seek forgiveness from Allah and he would forgive them. So this, this speaks volumes for us in the sense that when we try to live uh, a razor thin, perfect life, obviously we want to avoid sin as much as we can, but sometimes we treat sin as the ultimate pitfall that we, if we do it, we're completely undeserving of any kind of repentance, any kind of reward that we are completely lost. But we see in the, uh, the saying of the Prophet Muhammad that 
in that sin is an opportunity that Allah has created for us to access forgiveness. Uh, we see the importance of forgiveness is not just for Allah to give or that Allah needs anything from our forgiveness or our request for forgiveness uh, or for us to access it. But psychologically think about what going through the process of forgiveness does to you. When you wrong a friend of yours, when you wrong somebody who you can talk to, who you can see, uh, and you go through that process of forgiveness, you sit with them, you ask them for forgiveness, you, 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 uh, you, know, you admit to your mistakes and you, know, you hope that uh, with sincerity that they forgive you, you go through that really emotional, tough process. Um, you come to terms with what you did. You make amends, you do the hard work and you do the heart work. Uh, and you come out a better person having rectified that. Now, thinking similarly with respect to our forgiveness for our sins, that we sometimes just say, I stuck for a lot, now we're okay, we're, we're all good. But think about the, the harm that we sometimes cause uh, and think about how, uh, when we rectify that, how that can uh, affect us, not just psychologically, but spiritually as believers. So we look at uh, the example the Prophet Sassam oftentimes lifted up of uh, the purification of metals, that before uh, a metal goes into a furnace, it might be a rock, it might be filled with impurities, but it goes into a furnace uh, and that furnace takes away the impurities and leaves the, uh, the valuable part there. And similarly for us, when we uh, go through this furnace of asking for forgiveness, the process of forgiveness, rectifying our wrongs and making amends, that we too are shed of those impurities. But it doesn't mean it's going to be an easy one-off or it's going to be something easy to do. It's going to be something that's difficult, but it's a process that helps you become a higher being than you are before you commit it. And so uh, the second hadith, he who repents of a sin or she who repents of a sin is like the one who never sinned. What, uh, what, you know, we, we speak of with respect to um, this aspect of forgiveness and repentance, that it's not something that's cheap. It's something that takes work, but it's something that has a reward of removing these blemishes as such. We see that the Prophet ﷺ lifted up with respect to what removes sins. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, the footsteps to the congregational prayers, sitting in the mosque after prayers, doing proper ablution, even difficulties. And uh, he was asked, what else? feeding other people, being soft and lenient in your speech, doing the prayer in the night while people are sleeping. And the Prophet lifts up that verily the Muslim prays while the sins hang over his head and every time he prostrates, some of them fall down. And when he finishes the prayers, the sin has fallen away. I apologize, this isn't a hadith, this is uh, a wisdom, I believe, that uh, verily the Muslim prays while his sins hang over his head and every time he prostrates, some of them fall down. And when he finishes the prayer, his sins will have fallen away. That this aspect of the, the forgiveness of sins comes by some of those things we've become routine to. Some of the things that we feel are just ritual, we see that there's actually quite a bit of benefit in them, um, especially when it comes to just the, the, the simple things. We sometimes think that only forgiveness of sin comes from when we go into proper salah or we intentionally ask for a stuck for Allah uh, and forgiveness of Allah, uh, but it can happen even in the most mundane things, walking to the prayer, sitting in meditation, uh, doing proper ablution, uh, even in difficulty, feeding other people, being good to other people. These are ways to also rectify some of those sins. There's a wisdom that's lifted up um, uh, by Ali Uthman al-Hujwiri that says that you must know that the repentance or toba is the first state of pilgrims on the way to truth, just as purification or tahara is the first step of those who desire to serve God. And another wisdom that from, comes from Shams Tabrizi, the teacher of Rumi, that in my view, no one can become a Muslim just once. He becomes a Muslim and then becomes an unbeliever and then again becomes a Muslim and each time something comes out of him. So it goes until he becomes perfect. That this aspect of perfection is not something that is just from us being 100% uh, on our A game and you know unblemished at all, but it is a process that that perfection entails an imperfection, but the process is what helps make it perfect that we continue to try. So in light of these wisdoms, in light of the hadith, may Allah allow us to recognize the leniency that our tradition gives with respect to uh, us improving, that uh, with respect to um, us becoming better humans, better Muslims. And we recognize the fact that uh, our uh, sinfulness, our mistakes, our wounds are not definitive of us if we do uh, recognize that we can be better. So may Allah allow us to find perfection 
through our imperfections, allow us to see that our mistakes are not what define us as they did not define our predecessors before us. We ask that Allah lighten the burden of our guilt and our shame and our difficulty and that naturally uh, that naturally comes with our sins and that naturally comes with our mistakes and allow us to leave inshallah this Juma better than we entered it inshallah. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Rabbana wa rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Rabbana taqab Rabbana taqabbal minna. Inna ka anta samiul alim. Our Lord accept this prayer. Our Lord accept this service from us for thou art all hearing and all knowing. Juma Mubarak, inshallah, as we leave this Juma, please recognize that uh, any mistakes that we have made coming into this Juma, it's not the end of our story. We can continue to rectify these mistakes and come out even more polished, even more uh, improved, even more valuable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of how we came in today, that when we leave this Juma, we have the opportunity to leave just like these bowls that we've lifted up beforehand. We may be broken, we may be cracked, we may be chipped, but let's use our faith as a way to uh, anneal some of those cracks, to fill in some of the gaps, to put ourselves together, uh, and inshallah, leave this Juma uh, more complete, more valuable, uh, and more beautiful to not just ourselves, but to everything that is around us with the hopes of gaining Allah's pleasure. Inshallah, uh, I mean, again, Juma Mubarak, and uh, we'll see you all next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.